used to this little contraption, so. Is it running? It is now. And what's your name? Craig Rogers. Got it. Okay, uh, first the minutes of the December 12th board meeting. For your We're also, also in the minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe public comment. All in favor of approving the minutes as amended? Aye. Aye. Great. I abstain. Okay. Oh, so not recorded in the minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple of different things here. Um, Karen Quillen is here to talk about stormwater and flood control. And we have some people here. No, 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 so in your board package, there was a, a group of information about a proposed ordinance that would change uh, the zoning, let's see what it would be, the zoning at uh, 716 Bridge Road being resolved from rural residential to urban residential B. It's only one particular parcel uh, that is either owned or under purchase agreement with the Lathrop community. It's laying out back that they're looking to at some point develop to some degree in the future for what I've heard at public comments at City Council. So this was uh, asked by City Council to get, have the Board of Public Works provide a recommendation to the Council in regards to this ordinance. And what, what would the recommendation be or how would it be worded? Or what are the well, the words? ordinance is already, the, the language is already there. So we're not, we're just either saying recommend or not recommend, and we're not recommending the reasons why, I, was, I would assume. It's not too often that ordinance come down to this board for recommendation. So, first of all, we're talking, talking about a piece of property that's straight out back from the lake. You can drive all the way through, and that's it's beyond. They took it out of order, uh, And there's a stream oh. back there. We have some residents who'd like to comment on the how appropriate it would be to have further development back there. Can I just ask a question? Is it ordinarily, is it usual for the city council to ask us about the, the zoning recommendation? I've only seen it, I think, two times in my 12 years here to come down for recommendation. So do you have any feelings for why they're doing it? I think just engineering input, I mean, it's pretty, I think, clear in the subdivision rules and regulations and site plan applications what the requirements are for site development. Mm -hmm. But I think they're also concerned about, um, and I think the residents and the neighbors can uh, tell their concerns about what would happen or could happen if mm -hmm. this does pass. So, so the tension, as I see it, is between, on one hand, we have a process in place for addressing engineering concerns, runoff concerns, drainage issues. There's a process in place. And on the other hand, and this is where I'd ask you to uh, explain your concerns. And it's not it's not clear in my mind that we need to make a decision tonight if it just doesn't seem that we're able to resolve the, the, con the parent conflict. First of all, I'd like to thank the board for meeting up on the agenda. I appreciate that. Uh, Steve? Sussel, my neighbor here. First of all, my name is Richard Jasky. I live at 774 Bridge Road in Northampton. Uh, Steve lives uh, up the road from me. But I'd like to uh, address the fact that there's been some serious flooding concerns on that on that area. I mentioned before the meeting about the choke point at the Big Y. My land is eroding from this. Um, there's some issues on Hatfield Street. There's a high pressure gas line going through there. And um, David Cotton has also been affected by this, and I think David can't be here tonight. He's uh, on a job up in Vermont. But there's been some very serious flood issues there. I think it started back in 1990, uh, 
approximately around that time when they built that development. I think the engineering on the retention basins wasn't quite accurate. I think the retention basin filled uh, when the thing was under construction then flooded down through. I think Steve has a better history on it than I do, and I think he readdressed it. But the more pavement, the more roofs that you put up there, uh, sustainable Northampton would like to densify that area by changing the zoning. Uh, it's really going to impact the infrastructure of that Pine Brook drainage area. And uh, I'm pretty concerned about that. I think before the Lathrop community is given the okay to densify that area, I think I'd like to see the Board of Public Works look at the infrastructure of that whole area and the drainage uh, that is being uh, added to what's already there. Uh, and I think, for example, at the Edlu meeting last night, <clears throat> they brought up a good point. I think the point is is that when you engineer a project like that, uh, the engineering is done very good on site to retain the water, but it doesn't look downstream uh, what happens with that additional drainage. And uh, I mean, I'm not an engineer, and maybe I'm looking at it wrong, but I see what's happening. And I think their concern also is the fact that the infrastructure here has to catch up to what's being proposed. Uh, and um, uh, without getting more technical than that, I think I think you'd have to look at the culverts underneath Hatfield Street, and you got a big issue down at the Big Y. With, uh, you do have a small area that retains some <coughs> water on the uh, right-hand side of Cook, Cook Avenue is going down, uh, but you've got... For example, Chris Frank, and I, uh, I've asked Chris uh, if he could attend, he's rather busy with his business, but they're using part of his area from recommendations of the Conservation Commission, I think, back over the years, to actually retain some of the water that's coming down that brook so that it doesn't cause, uh, uh, you know, a flooding problem. But uh, uh, Connie Bushy, who lives right at the uh, base of, the, of Cook Avenue, uh, whose house is uh, right next to C.L. Frank's on the left, her place has been flooded out several times, seriously. And um, so if you were in my shoes, uh, you would have to address this to the Board of Public Works because uh, from what we're witnessing, uh, if we add to this situation, even if they put retention bases in, with the catastrophic rainfalls that we're having, I think it's a very uh, important thing to address. Just a clarification question, I'm going to get organized in my mind. So Fitzgerald Lake drains down toward Big Y. No. Is that's that, going the other way there? That is another, that's the Broad Brook. Okay. This is basically, this brook is not a year-round, this is a drainage. So the high point is somewhere between Fitzgerald Lake and Lathrop community, and once you get to Lathrop, it starts to drain toward the Connecticut? I think it's up well, by the Meadow Brook, that's where the drainage exactly divide sure. is. I think the southeast of Fitzgerald Lake, which becomes, it, for those who would know the area from years ago, the, the old pig farm, and Frank which if you went up to, uh, to St. Mary's Cemetery on Bridge Road and went back into there, that's where the pig farm was. It levels out in it's lower than... So at that point, the water to, starts going down towards CL Frank. That's the beginning of the watershed. So it's okay. a big area, and it has some very particular characteristics of being able to hold so much, and then whoosh, everything comes. Mm -hmm. I can give you some descriptions of that going back to 1955 in the hurricane. But we, we've had pictures that David Cotton brought to one of the meetings, and I'm sure you'd be glad to bring it in here, uh, the first chance it gets showing that large, that high pressure gas main that crosses Hatfield Street feeds UMass. I think it feeds the boiler plant at UMass. They put the that coach in there to increase the capacity of it. You've got a kind of a situation going on here where you've got a, a road that was built, rebuilt in 1969. You've got undersized, undersized culverts in it, to, I think, uh, from what's been happening with development up the street. Uh, and you also have a major uh, culvert down where the uh, Pine Brook crosses underneath the uh, uh, Hatfield Street itself, and that's been flowed over. I'm sure, Ned, you've, you've uh, been involved. 2007, it flowed over during the April Nor'easter. It actually took out the roadway. Right. So, those are, I don't want to keep repeating myself, okay. but those are our concerns. <coughs> Just a question. 
Has the gas company gotten involved in the interest there? I didn't see too much of that. I can give you a little history. When, they, when the <coughs> UMass decided to go with gas, there wasn't enough service capacity in Amherst, so they decided to tap into the line over here by the bike path on Hatfield Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, had to, they had to do a siting, and there was multiple paths. One of the paths was where it is now down Hatfield Street. Uh, and that was controlled by a siting commission of the state, which held a public hearing, which I attended and others. And I gave them the story of the area they, that was their preferred route, which is where it ended up. It goes down Hatfield Street onto North King Street onto Hatfield Road, down through Hatfield, under the river. And uh, I, I made the point that, very in very specific terms, that that is a dangerous area, and I thought the alternate routes might be better for the city in general. Uh, because of the my experience with the hurricane in 1955, I had lived there for uh, uh, two years, three years. There was about 14 inches of rain that uh, the pig farm swampy area up there became saturated. Everything came down Pound Brook and it took Hatfield Street with it at that time. And there was no big Y, there was no gas mains, there was no anything really. And I can I stood there on, on Hatfield Street with my father and he said, see what the storm water can do? And there was about 150 feet of Hatfield Street was gone. And, you know, they rebuilt it, and then we haven't had that 50-year storm. I believe that was a 50-year storm, at least well, 50 years ago. I don't know about today. Uh, so we're due for another one. And we installed the gas pipe, and we, uh, there's been, it wasn't bunkerized or anything or, or hardened in any way against that type of a situation. I mean, I remember large oak trees coming down through there. It was quite an event when you're three years old. And, uh, or five, I'm sorry, five years old. But uh, after it was sited and installed, I, I decided to call Berkshire Gas because I felt like my, the whole process was I, I didn't feel the people that should know knew. So I got on the horn and I called Berkshire Gas, and I finally found a, a person known as the distribution manager who worries about the system and what's there and what condition it is in and what are the hazards. And I said, do you, do you understand this situation? And I gave him a thumbnail sketch, and he said, nobody ever mentioned it to me. And I said, well, he said, can I come down and, and you can show me? So he did, and I did. And it, he, he's put that into a system, as I understand it, as a vulnerable spot. And, you know, so that they can alert valving uh, and have all that in preparation in case there ever is a problem. So, so let's circle back to the erosion. I'd like to just get back to the erosion a little bit. I mean, that's the issue of um, runoff. Personally, I, I feel like I don't feel like I'm in a position to make a determination on this. Ned has pointed out that there's a process in place that may be sufficient. You, all of your concerns seem seem to indicate that caution would be indicated here. Um, anyone have any thoughts as far as? Yeah. Well, we can talk about the infrastructure also, because that was part of the conversation that was ongoing too, the, the lack of sufficient infrastructure. Once it gets to Cook Avenue, it goes under Cook Avenue, it goes into a detention facility of some sort that's owned by either Big Y and or Walmart, one of the two. It's all private drain lines after that. It goes into the state system that we have no control over, and then eventually goes down the Connecticut River. So if we're looking to enhance infrastructure, it's all private or state-maintained infrastructure and not ours that is part of the, chuck, the, the problem with the choke point. So I'm not sure how we would address that going forward. 
typically most of our street work is done on based on a 10 year storm event to pass a 10 year storm event which is I think um, about two and a half three inches of rain in a 24 hour period and so what we're seeing of late is in the past at least three years we've gone from 30 35 inches of rain a year to over 50 inches of rain a year and with it we're seeing these huge deluges of rains that you know historically the city and most municipalities never designed to but they're happening now so it's just part of the equation too the fact that things are changing in our rain patterns and the intensity of the rainfalls that systems weren't designed to handle either Could I just comment? Uh, hold on a second let me get the, the board a chance to weigh in here what I just heard tells me that this zoning change development whatever is almost irrelevant that if we did nothing there's a problem that's what I get so it's, it's a whole other issue the issue that you know of the change in zoning which brings more development typically does certainly you've got pavement you've got roofs you've got impervious services but theoretically that would be dealt with through detention systems of one kind or another the question is <coughs> does any of it really matter whether whether we do that or not if we have this problem with the size of the culvert first off going under Hatfield Street then going into Cook and then going under the entire group of buildings that is Big Y and all of the shops and the parking lots and the whole thing and I have a great memory of that ditch going through there and when they cut the trees down yeah this fabulous clay land and it lasted about one weekend <laughs> great I used to burn the boxes at the Big Y in the incinerator and the ditch was still there containing the brook which is now something rainy. First, I, I don't think we have a good enough understanding of this to make a decision tonight. So I, I'd agree with you there. It it sounds like until we get to Hatfield Street, everything that's taking place is on private property. Is that correct? It's private yeah. property upstream of yours, yeah. and and yours is being negatively impacted because of uh, yeah, high saying, flows yeah. that that drainage channel wasn't prepared to take. And I, I don't I don't see where the city fits into solving that problem. I mean, I, I sympathize with the problem, but I don't know that where we have the authority. Never mind the fact that we don't have the money. But <laughs> where we would even have the authority to do something to fix that. Now we do have a concern about, I assume, a city culvert under Hatfield Street. Right? That's it. That must be ours. Mm -hmm. That is ours, and what happened in the April or the Easter of 2007, it got clogged with debris, and it just elevated and ran over, over top the roadway and took out a good part of the roadway. Uh, since then, we have built and installed a trash rack around the entrance, so that at least the debris won't initially get in there or rise and fall with the water, and hopefully it will keep flowing. Uh, we didn't have a problem during um, Irene, Hurricane Irene, in uh, August of 2011 with it. Um, so it appears to be working, but the fact that we still have constant erosion of the stream bed is is the concern of the neighbors also. But if you, if you look at city infrastructure, is that our own city infrastructure? No, we actually have some, we had that piece of infrastructure there, but further up the hill, there's infrastructure that comes down. We did an emergency repair, and this is Steve Susco's property, I believe it was a year ago, two years ago. Uh, that's the picture. You see the the outfall hanging out in the middle of the yeah. air in the stormwater management study work? That's where that came from. Mm -hmm. I, uh, reference to the two photographs, this was uh, orientation. Is that Hatfield Street, Gargas? Yes. And which side of Hatfield Street? Your side? Okay, so the flow is coming through the, uh, the ditch that that's goes down to Cook Avenue. That's basically the street drainage plus uh, the nursing home plus uh, Prospect Woods, whatever else is contained in that. And where is this? That's, just, that's about 200 feet up Hatfield Street, up, looking up, in the up same west. direction. So this 
this is the outfall from this pond? Yeah. What, well, what partially, is, yeah. What is this big here? No, it's no, actually it's not. That's not the outfall from this pond. There's okay. another outfall further up. What what can you say about this that would tell me where I am? Because what is this, this pavement? Is the, what is this, this would be Hatfield Street. This, I'm well, on Hatfield Street? This would be Bridge Road. This is uh, Dave Cotton's backyard. I think that's the entrance to his house. Yeah. So the, the, the wood chip pile that I can see is probably behind you. Right over here. Okay. Right here. Okay. All right. Okay. If you go over to Dave Cotton's driveway, that canoe was on the left. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. This would be the drainage. There's basically two major uh, points of the existing Lakeshore community where drainage leaves it. This is the one towards the road. So was There's this constructed by Lakeshore? This was not constructed by them. This is the result of, this, of putting Lathrop home there. Okay. Okay. That's why we're, you know, yeah. we're screaming. Sure. Because, and Dave Cotton put it the best. He said, you know, well, we accommodate our neighbors to this point, but, mm. you know, now it's time to, we can't just keep making it worse. Yeah. Nice. Do, you, do you see any options here from your perspective? I mean, it, 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 personally, just giving a blanket approval, like yes, there's a process in place. I'm sure they'll they'll figure this out. Go for it. Doesn't feel entirely comfortable. I mean, they can always design with engineering controls to even oversize systems to uh, reduce so that currently what they have to do is pre and post development flows have to equal each other. So basically, in its natural state, a certain amount of water flows off that property over a certain period of time and gets into the brook. And they develop it with roof driveways and the rooftops and so on. The time of concentration is going to increase. The water is going to try to get there faster, so they detain it in detention basins, and they slowly release it over a period of time. So in the perfect world, basically, you design it that there is no net increase in flow. However, the duration of flow over time is going to be longer. So technically, there's no impact of exceeding the, the pre-development flows, but the flow is going to go for, instead of an hour after the rain event, it's going to go for four hours after the rain event. It's just going to flow longer. Are, are the same standards in effect now as were in effect when the late trip was built? Yes. So that's theoretically in balance. That's correct. And we're still using 10-year storm design? Um, I'd have to ask Doug McDonald, but I believe that those systems are designed for 100-year events. Okay. There was, I thought I heard you say 10 years. Street drainage is designed for 10-year events. But the basins, I think, are designed for 100 years. Right. So you can over-design so that it will build a bigger basin, put a smaller outlet pipe, and you reduce the amount of flow so your post-development flows are even smaller than pre-development, but that's just engineering work that would need to be done at the time of uh, construction. So there's ways that you can mitigate it, but currently the way the rules and regulations and policies are set up there, you don't have to over-mitigate, you have to control existing and post-construction. But that's a development question, isn't it, rather than a zoning question? It is part of development. But with this change of zoning, they're going to be able to densify the property and do more with it than they could before. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> if you slow the if you slow the water down, but you can have the same net flow. You can have the same peak flow for four or five hours longer. But if you have that peak flow for one hour, it does one hour's worth of damage. If you have that peak flow for four hours, it does four hours worth of damage for the same rain event. So you're actually doing more damage. You're, you're spreading out the damage. You're going to get the same. If it's going to happen, you're going to get so much erosion in one hour. We see it at we see it uh, at the fairgrounds, and that was what was brought up by the conservation commission uh, member of Edlu last night. The, the <coughs> drainage is slowed down, but it drains for a longer period of time. The same amount of water over a longer period. The same amount of net flow. So you get that same flow for a longer period. Well, 
the gallon, is. The gallons per minute, though, would be decreased by the increase of time. Okay. If you double the amount of time. Right. <coughs> and, and, and I bring to mind the GZA study about the Upper Roberts Smith. It said 16 million gallons of water. It was going to devastate so much area in leaves. You've got 24 million gallons that is retained behind Hatfield Street. And the gas main that you saw exposed uh, in your in the study, eight feet beyond that, is a 12-inch high-pressure gas main at, at 600 pounds. And Columbia Gas, who does not own that, it's owned by Berkshire Gas, said if the atmospheric conditions are right, that pipe, should it fail, would fill that 38-acre site of Big Y and Walmart. <coughs> somewhere between every four to seven minutes to 12 foot high. So there was, a, so there's a lot of concerns that the neighbor has. And then, but let's, let's look at it this way too. We're also <coughs> charged with trying to find a way to fix the stormwater right now. We're in the middle of it. Um, so if we change zoning, we continue to change zoning to allow possibly more development and more drain on our superstructure, on our infrastructure, then it makes it that much more difficult to sell it to the public that we need more money to fix the infrastructure. So, and, and also Lathrop says they have no plans right now for development. So I don't see the rush. Now we postponed this at Edlu last night to get more information and put more, more information together, more study, more, try to get some more answers. Um, because Lathrop does not have any, they have no intention of development right now. It could be years down, down the line. Um, and zoning always seems to uh, come before infrastructure. We always seem to dump more zoning or, or more development and then try to get the infrastructure to catch up. So I don't see any. So we're going to postpone it in Edlu. Uh, and we, we, we may send it off with no recommendation. We don't know. Thank you. Is there any appetite for postponing this? I'm not, I'm not adverse to a vote if that's. I don't understand what was going on. I mean, it, it just, it seems like that we don't really have that much to say. I mean, if the engineering, if the DPW engineering is not really making a comment on anything, or, and it is more of a development issue, and there are stormwater implications, it seems like we should postpone it until after we know where we're going with stormwater. I just want to let the process go here a little bit. I would also say uh, I'm, 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 I'm with you and uh, Councilman Casey. I, with, with no plan in place, I'm not sure what, how, how we can be well advised about what a change in the ordinance is going is to is going how it's going to impact this. I, I, I think it would seem more natural to me that when they had a development plan that they wanted to put forward, that that would be the time to, to seek a, a change in zoning so that we could have something concrete to look at as far as what it was that they were going to be doing going forward. And it's, and it's really typical if you don't, you try to get your zoning in place to make it easier to jump in with the development and so wait for the development. Yeah. I move that we postpone this second. possible any kind of recommendation to the city council. I second. <coughs> If there's no problem up there, why are we here? If the engineering was done right up at Lathrop Community, why are we having this problem? You know, that's the question I have. I, I don't understand. I, the engineering is probably done very well, but for some reason it's been exacerbated. And, you know, we, we're the ones that are going to have to bear the brunt of this. If we, that was a very good point uh, that Mr. Parsons I think, brought up. That, yeah, it's all our property. It's private land. But if this goes ahead, and uh, we've already got a problem apparently with some engineering here somewhere, because we're getting flooded. And if we add to this further, then uh, we don't want to aggravate you people. We don't we don't enjoy that at all. But there's something wrong. Well, we're mm -hmm. discussing uh, making no recommendation, just tabling the issue. Thank you. Are you arguing that we should make a decision? No, 
I think it's a good idea to postpone it. I agree. I, the thing I want to make a point about is the fact that the previous engineering, apparently there's some problems there. And maybe there's a mistrust hmm. here on our part. Anything else at the board? I'll leave. I think we're I think we're all set to, to vote on it. Uh, I just want to try to shed some light on why the question was bumped down here. Mm, I don't. I, 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 think, I think we're good now. We 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 put a good amount of time on it. Um, I'd like to keep the rest of our meeting moving along. So I'm going to call the question. Uh, a yes vote is a vote to uh, take no action to postpone any decision on this issue. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any against? Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I move that we take um, solid waste planning update out of order. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is your committee you have a spokesperson? You don't. No. <laughs> I can speak Thank from you, that. Thank you, Richard. Here we do. Actually, city engineer. <laughs> I'll speak from that, and then some board members can jump in. Um, we had a subcommittee meeting recently. We did one last week, last, last Friday. Friday. Yep. Thursday. 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 Um, <clears throat> staff met with um, three of the board members to um, talk about options for the future here after the land proposes. Um, we talked about services to be provided and how we would uh, continue to pro provide some solid waste collection means for the residents. And we came up, uh, the board members came up with, um, I guess, a recommended option. Be so bold as to put mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. out in the, in the document that I sent around, um, which basically would involve. It's, uh, an option that would involve the continued use of the Locust Street Transfer Station for solid waste and recyclables collection of bottles and cans and paper. Um, that would be open six days a week, Monday through Saturday. Uh, Glendale, uh, Glendale Road Transfer Station would only be open on Saturdays for um, collection of difficult to manage wastes. So some materials that take room to manage and we don't have the room here at Locust Street to, to take on any of those materials. So. The idea would be to um, get a permit from the state to continue Glendale Road activities for one day a week for bulky waste, white goods, scrap metal tires, mattresses, those sorts of things that we collect there. In addition, we would um, establish a residential roof and yard waste program that would also be managed at the Glendale Road site, and that would be open. Um, I forget the specifics about it. We have an outline for the plan that would be open basically in the spring and fall for several weeks, and then one week a month in the summer months, and then we'd be open right after Christmas to put Christmas trees in for shipping. And that would be run and managed by uh, highway department staff on, on a Saturday to manage the composting operation. So those were sort of the, 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 uh, the services that would be provided. We would be looking at... Um, Contracting with waste management to bring our waste down to the Chippy landfill at the end of the way to run disposal of pit fee. Um, the city would continue to operate the transfer station and do the waste hauling from our local street that we do right now. Those are things that we have looked at in detail previously with the subcommittee. Um, there was uh, some preliminary information that was distributed by email to the board. Some numbers that we had um, pulled together based on, on, on our cost structure, on expenses and revenues. We had some discussion about um, trying to match the revenues with the expenses and, and ways to achieve uh, sort of a positive uh, balance in the enterprise fund moving forward. And uh, basically, what was discussed in that subcommittee meeting was um, a proposal to maintain the vehicle permit fee of $25 a year, which it is right now. Um, continue the needs-based discount system that was implemented earlier um, and increase the price of the blue bags by 50%. So the new pricing would be $0.75, cents, $1.50, or $3, depending on the size of the bag. And then um, a couple of other uh, little bits of information with the fee structure. We would take the food waste composting, which there's a fee now to participate in that. We would make that free to residents to purchase a vehicle permit. And the leaf and yard waste composting would be f also free to residents that purchase the vehicle permit. So it's sort of a group of services that would be available for those that get the permit. And um, some
some modifications in the bag fees to reflect the need for more revenue to match the increasing expenses. So I think that's kind of a broad brush overview of, of what we talked about in the meeting. Um, and I guess if the board members have, if I missed anything or things you want to chat about. Mm -hmm. There was um, some mention of allowing small businesses to use Locust Street if they were using blue bags and you know, recycling. Mm -hmm. That was brought up. Yes. Yeah, it was it was brought up. I don't think we've made any decision about whether to do that or not. And the implications, I think, are not fully known at this point. But um, we did talk about the fact that um, it was interesting. MJ brought the point up in the subcommittee meeting, and, I, and apparently I've been reading the state's draft always master plan. Actually, the state is encouraging communities that have drop-off centers to allow small businesses access to them to recycle. It's kind of interesting. That MJ brought it up at the same point where. The state is looking at um, statewide as a as a need for small businesses that may not have easy access to recycling as a way to increase recycling activity. So, so it's certainly an interesting uh, interesting thing. So I, I I missed that on the on the statewide recycling, but it, this is this is a concern. <coughs> My concern about this is that I, I would, if, it's a, if it's better for the environment, then we want to be supportive. I just want to make sure equal access is, is something that we consider, so that if we were let, letting some small businesses participate, we would have some way of defining <coughs> what that meant. I was, yeah, that was going to be my question, which is how does, how does Northampton, and this room may not know this, but how do we define a small business? Do we have somebody else's definition? Do we have our own? Is it, we don't. Is it when I see it, I know it kind of thing? I think it would. Well, I, it, to us, to me, it means anyone that is willing to bring their trash in and move that. I, I, I or, uh, about cardboard. I think they were talking about recycling. Is that the? And with recyclables. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We, but but the key on trash was blue bags. So it's sort of a, a self-regulating volume yeah. thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If it's feasible to bring it in in blue bags, then yeah. then yeah. we think that's beneficial to the operation of this op this mm -hmm. facility mm -hmm. because we'll make money. And if if the business finds that that's unmanageable and they need to use a compactor, then they they deal with their waste separately. That's excellent. I, I didn't really catch on to that. Yeah. But isn't are we just talking about recycling? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. I, think I, think the, everything. I think the bags. I, yeah. I, my sense was everything because. Mm -hmm. If well, I was already filling my truck up with cardboard and bringing the. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I had this vision of you know thousands of people stuffing millions of bags and the kind of thing. <laughs> that wasn't that the state initiative. Recycling? Well, it sounds like the state initiative talks yeah. about the recycling. I think the, the state was the most concerned about recycling access, making it more universal. Right. But and our just but our discussion was more about blue bags. I think in, in recycling. I think. Yeah, my sense is, is that you know, if a, if a small business can manage their trash and wants to manage their recycling, why not give them the opportunity to do that here? We're, we're going to be running this thing anyway. The, the more bags we have coming in that that don't lose money for us, I think that they, the volume will help us. Okay, so I'm, yeah. I'm comfortable with the blue bag. That, that's great. I'm now wanting if maybe we should discuss the recycling. Is proposed by the state as a separate issue. Did because you guys didn't discuss that in your group. We didn't. That was so I. I was envisioning just using it as a, a household would use it. So <coughs> recycling and the blue bags. Yeah. That's that's if you're looking at me. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I assumed was that um, any business of a size that could manage all of their waste, recyclables and and trash in a manner similar to a resident that you could use the facility. And would they still have to have a vehicle permit? Oh, sure. Yes. Yes. I think that's self-regulating also because if a business produces such a large quantity of recyclables that that there's a, there's a, a valuable resource to them that I don't mm -hmm. think they'll give it away to us. They'll find a hauler to take their cardboard away and get some money for it. Well, and recycling is much more um, convenient at the landfill. They can actually drive right up to the compactor and 
here they have to park and make many, many trips, and that's going to be self-limiting. You know, if, if they've got a lot of cardboard, they're going to handle it on their own site, not come up here and make 20 trips from their vehicle to their Fair enough. Will there be um, recycling accepted at Glendale Road? Not as proposed. That's what it, so it seems like, so that so the convenience factor will limit the recycling out. Yes. Okay. Uh, did yeah, I was at that meeting the other day and uh, did a little bit of reading and research between then and now. And one of the things I noticed was we had 1,500 fewer customers this year than last year. So that lost us anywhere between $7,500 and $37,000, depending on who those customers were. And then Michael Parsons at some point made the point that we need $100,000 to keep the whole operation going. And shortly thereafter, Karen made the comment that the bags have cost us $100,000. For, for more than a year of bags. Well, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a cost factor, yes. and right. we didn't have that much. <coughs> and mentioning the small business, if you're going to ask a small business to solve their trash problem by coming to us for three bucks a bag, and the opportunity to go to Valley Recycling is approximately the same hours, with the dumpster right next to where they park it. Yeah, why would they come to us in the first place? So this idea that you're going to get all this extra income from yeah. these small businesses is, is a non-factor. I don't think we're expecting a lot of them. I think we're well, just looking even, to be... Well, being goody two-shoes to allow them to do it, I don't think it's your business. All right, so you're, you're just encouraging us to be cautious about the revenue projections? Right, very cautious. And the other thing is, Karen mentioned <laughs> that we're going to be going to single-stream trash. Paper and everything that mixed together. No, I didn't say that. The, 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 the Springfield Murph is going single stream, and we would have the option of delivering dual stream in 2015. Okay, so apparently we have a contract with them for a certain period of time. The price of uh, mixed paper right now is fifty dollars a ton. And how far does it have to go if we wanted to give it to somebody, sell it to somebody closer than the Murph? take it to Sonico or one of the other mills. We could take the cardboard out on site since we own all these new compactor boxes. Cardboard is going for $90 a ton. And the Murph is going to be giving us, she said down to 17 or less, nothing pretty soon. Well, right now we're getting about $25 a ton. About but the future, we're looking but at the that's future. about half of what we were getting six months ago. And the future is going to be even less. Looking at so if, if I could, Dick, your two points are ca be cautious about the income projections, and you seem to be encouraging us to consider alternatives to a single waste stream. Well, when you go up to three bucks a bag, you're going to lose more than 1,500 people. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when you close Glendale, well, I mean, for the people near Glendale, it's as easy for them to go to Valley Recycling as it is to come trucking down to Okay, Street. so let, let me keep moving. Jim? Um, you know, Dick was at the meeting the other day. He made some really good points. A lot of these points he made in the meeting, and um, you know, they, they were insightful. The board had a lot of discussions about about these issues of losing customers and the impact on revenue. We have lost a number of customers. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but Dick was reciting what they were. We've seen a reduction in customers, but because of the increase in the fee, the revenues have actually increased from the vehicle permits this year. So there's a there's a balance that the subcommittee was aware of in terms of increasing fees and loss of customers. Um, in terms of the revenue projections, a couple of good points. Um, we haven't banked on any business revenue in this thing, um, not in the numbers that I sent around. So um, we're not banking on, any, on anything happening really in that regard. And the concern about the MRF revenue that, uh, that Dick raises, I think, is, is pretty valid. I think we're, we've talked about it internally. It's a little premature to know exactly what's going to happen, but basically, we achieve revenue now from the MRF from bringing our materials down there. And in the future, when the MRF switches to single stream, those revenues are going to go down and they might be zero, but these things still have value. And I, I would say that I, I'm probably in, in great agreement with Dick where we collect materials in different streams and these materials have value. And is there a way to market them directly to achieve a revenue stream rather than just bringing everything down to the MRF and getting nothing out of it? So. Really good points in my mind. I'm not sure exactly um, how we will deal with that other than we're cognizant that these are things that we need to be aware of. And when the time comes in the next year, two years, 2015, or whenever the MRF goes 
single stream, then yeah, we want to make we want to take a hard look at that because otherwise, you know, how much revenue are we giving away by continuing to, pers to participate in the MRF? I'm sure it's a very complicated issue, and Karen could probably go on for a while about it. But I think the the basic point is, it's important to realize that these things have revenue when we're collecting them, and there's what's all the best way to maximize them. So I, I think yeah. that's true. And if there's no way to maximize them, the other point is that we have a revenue uh, stream from the MERV in the revenue section here that if, if there are no viable options or something, that revenue portion goes to zero or some smaller number, and then it impacts the system in terms of our ability to balance the budget. Well, the city clearly wants us to offer some service once the landfill closes. And that was our attempt to. I mean, you know, e even even feeling cautiously uh, about <coughs> the numbers, we still have to forge ahead with something. Well, yeah. the, the other the other thing is, Connecticut's gone to single stream in many places. Bridgeport, I guess, went to single stream. They got MERV that couldn't compete. They went out of business. So well, now now tra now we now we enter transportation issues. Well, let, let, let's go to try to keep things moving yeah, more complicated. I just want to commend the point. subcommittee because I really like the fact that we're increasing the amount of money on the bags and, and keeping the vehicle permits <clears throat> stable. So I think that was a great adjustment compared to the earlier um, decision. So I just want to thank the committee for that. Okay. Just want to know what white goods are. Appliances. Uh, large appliances. Even <coughs> 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 almond goods. <coughs> almond goods. <coughs> Would you have um, harvest yellow? Harvest yellow. Or avocado. Avocado. You have to paint it white before it breaks. We only take white ones. Well, the all right. So the staff is um, hoping that we can make some decision tonight on this. Uh, there are contracts to be considered. They like to go out for bidding on the hauling, um, start lining <coughs> things up. Um, at this point, we're six months, less than that, five months from four meeting months. for four oh, months, yeah. three months from well, going live. Yeah. Well, I would make a proposal that we accept the um, option two as, as provided to us by the salary base. Planning subcommittee and um, initiate this new process. As of, I mean, in terms of the pricing, would we do it as of July 1st? Yeah. Do we have enough time to do that? Okay, so. Well, so go ahead sooner. We're going to change the color of the bag. It, it, we it could do it sooner. It has to be sooner. It has to be yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you're saying yes, it does have to be sooner. Well, well, permits. well, permits would be July first, mm -hmm. but we could increase the bag prices earlier. Jim has a thought on that. I do. I'm bursting at the seams. <laughs> <laughs> Stop waving my hands. Um, I think the one thought is that when the landfill closes, that's the point where we need to implement this. Mm -hmm. So that could be, you know, in April, for example. So we would need to have basically an approval to implement this system as we were talking about. Uh, sort of the, the day that the landfill ceases accepting waste, and then we could move into this new, you know, what the new day looks like. So it would be this. So it would really be tied to the stopping, you know, ceasing of landfill operations. Because everything you do at Glendale is tied to a contract with all the solutions. So the day they stop operating is really the day that things need to change. And that's the way we'd like to roll, we'd kind of like to roll this out. Um, Can so I actually suggest that we? implement this so that there's some overlap so that so we don't stop on Saturday doing it one way and then or, or, we, or we implement this shut down Glendale move everything to Locust Street so we have some overlap of how the system's working with the backup of the landfill just in case we need it I don't understand how that would work actually well that we, we move to this system of what's open but um, not have that have that happen, say two weeks in advance when the landfill actually closes down, to give us a little flexible so, adjustment. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to have a target date, is what you're yeah. looking so at. Maybe April first. This right. just happens, but if, and if the landfill continues for another month and a half, so be it. The operations mm -hmm. of the Glendale Road Transfer Station have changed. Yeah. 
but that means you only allow commercial haulers in. We have to turn away. I mean, there'll be no residential drop-off there, mm -hmm. even though we'll be open five days a week. Ron? I think Gary was ahead. Well, I, I'm I, just think, I think it's tied mostly to the bag fee. So on April 1st, any bags that are for sale have to be three bucks. Mm -hmm. And you get to use the $2 ones, for instance, until you're out of them, so that even if the landfill closes on April 15th, you can still use the, the bags that you have now until you run out. But the next ones you buy, obviously, will be more. So I'm thinking, I used only the big ones, so that's why I need okay. two in case. Um, can you control yourself? i <laughs> um, I just wanted, I, with due respect to you and your comments, I would just leave it up to the to the staff to yeah. make that decision. I've um, just seen, uh, uh, just the experience sometimes when you shut off one I option understand. and switch to another. Sometimes yeah. it's, it's nice to have a little flexibility yeah. no, for implementation. I, I totally understand you, but <coughs> I think you guys are going to figure it out. We can pick a day to, to do this. Um, uh, my mind just delves into the details, of course, um, and there's a lot of contractual types of stuff that we need to think about. Um, I think it's feasible um, to do it. I mean, picking a date does make sense because you can advertise in advance and get the word out and things, but I think the date has to be sooner than later, and the trick would be to have overlapping contracts, possibly, with solid waste solutions with what they're doing with the landfill and then what we're going to be doing in the future in terms of following and what our contracts have been. So there's some logistical and contractual things that need to be thought about. And Karen, were you? Oh, I just wanted to say that um, we had a meeting of all the grandchildren's at Focus Street um, attendants and waymasters today and went over this proposal, and they were very supportive. Um, they were a little concerned about outreach, you know, so that everybody knows what's happening when. Um, the transition of, you know, the, all the bags that we have in inventory have pricing in the packages, so we have to take that into consideration how long our inventory will be. <coughs> but you mentioned that there might be two months' worth of bags. Yeah. Like, so Couldn't we just let them naturally, like, some people will get a bargain for six mm -hmm. weeks past the date and other people... Yeah. Yep. So we have some details like that. I just wanted to bring up that the um, that that all the frontline um, employees were were very pleased with the with the structure of it. That's keeping the permit the same, increasing the bag fee, and and offering uh, food waste to all <coughs> customers. And they really saw that as a value. Adds value to the permit. Mike. What happens when you run out of bags and people find oh, out about it? Hang on a second. Start hoarding. <laughs> So this was discussed at the joint meeting on Monday with the uh, city councilors that only one of the board members on that committee attended. Just me. <laughs> well, thank <laughs> goodness you were there. <laughs> and they made the point, and it was an excellent point, that we need to be very proactive in advertising the changes and advertising not only the cost increases but also the benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's another reason why I think we need to pick a date and focus on it and get that advertising out and, and get the signs up at both locations that tell people about the changes that mm -hmm. are upcoming so that they're, we try to avoid any surprises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so on, are we talking about motions? Oh. Are we talking about sequencing it such that the We'll pick a date for the switch over that day is when the bag prices go up. <coughs> it feels like there's a, a couple series of decisions we need to make here. Mm -hmm. a, 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 the date that we're going to move to this new system would close it down Glendale and using that only for um, difficult to manage waste. The bag, the date that the cost of the bags would go up. <coughs> and that those yeah. don't have to be the same date. No. Karen, are you Well, we, we have a little bit of experience transitioning from one system to the other, the stickers to the bags. It's almost the same thing we're going to have to go through. There's a, you know, people have a certain inventory. We did see as, you know, some 
free buying. <coughs> but at, at a certain point, we said you can't use the stickers anymore. You can you can come in and cash in the value, but you know there's an end point. Oh, so when they'd you have a couple of months or whatever, yeah. to, and then they could trade them in and get two dollars back. Yeah. Toward. At some point, they won't be able to use okay. those those bags at you know fifty cents a dollar, two dollars. They would have to cash it in for the new ones. Mike. So. How will we know which bags were purchased at the old price and which were purchased at the new? They would, they would have to be different. They would have to be different color. I'm, okay. I'm, I would like to go to a new vendor. Why can't we continue to use the blue bags and, and just change the price? Well, you could, except I really am not happy with the bags. <laughs> There's, well, obviously there's, there's, there's obviously a few details they need to be worked out. It could be the same date, but not the same date. The benefit of the same date is that people only need to know one date. Right. The benefit of multiple dates is that there are multiple dates that people need to deal with. But logistically, I think we need to figure out the details of changing the price of the bag and how long it, what's involved and how long it would take to figure out what that date would be. In other words, figure out what needs to be done, figure out the date, don't set the date, and then figure out that you can't meet it in terms of changing the bags. Mm -hmm. So I think there are some details that need to be worked on in the game. And just let me give Ned an opportunity here. Okay. You have a okay. passing thought. Okay. Thank you. Mark, um, I was proposing that we would adopt the, the, uh, <clears throat> the um, recommended option as proposed by the committee. And so I would like to still have that that motion on the table. I think somebody seconded it. Yes. Okay. And so the idea that the staff could come back to us with details about it, how it's going to be implemented. Right. And, and I, I, I think you're looking for enough of a go ahead to start working on the contracts. Yeah, that would be terrific. Yeah. 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 So. I'll second her motion. All right. No, it Mike did already. Right. 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 All right. Seconded it. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, any further discussion before we vote? All right, so a yes vote is authorizing the staff to move ahead with the contracts and the details, and we may hear from them with uh, questions and updates as we get closer. Yep. All in favor of passing the resolution? Aye. 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 And, and Dick, I think we all hear your concerns, and we, we can get <coughs> back to this. I'm sure we will get back to this over and over as the uh, as it actually rolls out. <clears throat> Just need to see you cutting your own throats by jacking up the price too much. Especially when you got low price competition down the street. That's we'll have to find out. The city has been crystal clear that they want us to do something that doesn't involve any tax money. Oh, I understand. That. And it, it may be that the product we get in the end is a, a small uh, baby version of what the city was hoping for. But we have to tackle it at some point, and I think that's what we're trying to do. Okay. <coughs> uh, now I think we're... Thank you, Karen. Back on schedule? Yeah. Thanks, Dick. Change order number three to Burke Construction for the landfill leachate treatment plant decommissioning in the amount of $28,000. Or credit? No. Is it a credit? It looks like a credit to me. All right. Looks like a credit. A credit in the amount of twenty eight thousand dollars. More approval. Second. Um, am I not bursting at the seams on this? I guess <laughs> not. This is a this is a uh, a change order for construction. Uh, it's a credit. Um, as described here, twenty eight thousand and change for um, a number of items. items that were, uh, the sum of all items is resulting in a credit, and I can read them briefly for you so you, get a, you can get a flavor of what they are. There were some changed conditions at the site and some other things that happened, um, and we were able to negotiate some credits here for the city. Um, the first two items were, were related to a credit for an electrical trench that, um, for removing an electrical trench that we thought was going to be necessary as part of a job. Um, the credit for the electrical contractor was $2,738, and the credit for the civil subcontractor for work that would have been associated with, the, with that was $8,040.29. Um, 
Item number three was uh, a change order relative to a garage door repair. The contractor reinstalled the overhead door for the second garage door onto the first garage door, which was not operational. Um, there was a, a charge of $318 for that. Item number four was related to additional cutting and capping of a piping at the uh, F1 pump station. It was um, something that DEP had requested that we do that had, wasn't originally in the contract document. The price for that was $1,033. Item number five was installation of additional flashing around the exterior of the building. Uh, flashing was installed around the exterior of the building to eliminate water penetration. It was a $5,000. $604 uh, change. Uh, there was a credit for equipment, the equipment pad floor repair. Um, at our request, the contractor removed equipment pad, pad, equipment pad floor repair from the scope and credited the schedule of the values and, um, that were bid, and it was $3,480 credit. There was a credit for a crack repair. At our request, the, the contractor um, removed from the scope uh, a crack repair and credited the, the amount for that, which was $892. <coughs> um, item number eight was additional cost associated with wealthy commissioning. It was a non-potable uh, water supply well on site that was used for process water. Um, the actual depth of the well was 650 feet. It was 500 feet deeper than the records had indicated. Increasing cost to decommission the well was $867.89. There was a credit um, for demolition waste disposal. Um, the contract was bid, <coughs> assuming that all waste disposal would, would not be at the city's landfill, it would be off-site. Um, we ended up negotiating, uh, taking some of the demolition material at the landfill. The contract was credited for $2,534.65. <coughs> Item number 10, similarly, was for credit for accepting residual waste from the outside lagoons. Again, we had bid the project assuming that these materials would be disposed of off-site. Um, we discussed this with DEP and received a permit modification in order to be able to take these materials up at the landfill. It resulted in a credit of $20,580.48. Um, there was a change order item to lower the calculation <coughs> rim elevation in on $286. And then uh, there was some additional cost uh, for the contractor to handle 25 uh, cubic yards of, of sludge in the lagoon that was beyond what was shown on the contract documents. That was an increase of $1,855.18. So, the sum of those is a twenty-eight thousand dollar credit, and that's where we are. Jim, do the um, contract documents have all of those line items, <coughs> or do we rely on them to look back in their records and tell us how much they had planned to spend on removing a pad? Or the contract's interesting. Uh, the contract was bid as a lump sum, so we have plans to show and identify all the work that needs to be done. Um, when some of the work and then when the contract is signed, we, we require the contractor to submit a schedule of values. So all the main contract items of work that are being done, they submit a value for that, and that's the basis for payment as the project moves along. When the work item is removed from, uh, from the project, um, it's even more interesting because under the terms of the contract, they don't get a credit. We don't get a credit for the schedule of values value we get a schedule, we get a credit based on an actual estimated amount that they submit. So for this trench, for example, if the schedule value said $10,000 and they submit, uh, they would submit a detailed uh, cost estimate that says we have two guys for four hours, we have this type of machine, this type of equipment, it's $6,700. Then we review that and say, is that a reasonable estimate? So. The schedule values is used for payment, but not used for credit. And that's sort of standard in the industry under the way these contracts are written. So um, when you have changes on a job like this, there's a little bit of paperwork back and forth mm -hmm. to make sure that the credits are appropriate and everyone's in agreement with what they are. Maybe more than you want. Are there ever, oh, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. the credits ever higher than the schedule of values? 
that's a good question. Uh, what it it would be. I, 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 you know, I, I don't have a, I don't have a recollection of a million of these things that I've done, but yeah. it's it's entirely possible that because it has to be proposed, the credit has to be proposed by the contractor and has to be approved by by our engineer and by us. So, I mean, the real values here. I was just going to say that the schedule values of the contractors. The only way you'd get a credit that's more than the schedule values of the contractor was way off. I mean, the wrong job. I'm looking at the wrong job because it would just never happen. I, I can't imagine how that would ever happen. You can imagine how that would happen? You can lowball an item on the, on the contract. It, it depends on the job and how the contractor prepares the original estimate. Because if their, if their original estimate didn't line up exactly with what the schedule of values ultimately is, there may be some rounding, we'll call this 5,000, this is 15,000, and there, sh there could be some sort of rounding in the schedule of values, but then when you need to provide the detail down to the hour and you know the amount of work, it may be, it may be different. Okay, so there's a change order. Any other questions? All in favor of approving this change order for a $28,000 credit. Uh, Contractor design and fitting services and construction phase services for the maintenance of the for the maintenance garage floor repair modifications. Time the bond and the amount of ninety seven hundred dollars. Second. That's a real that's a really long name. Is this the trench? Or is this for the where the lift the lifts are? This is the garage floor, the maintenance floor, which is where the lifts are. Where the guy <coughs> Oh, so it, or it is with it. Okay, it's well, not, the, can't not the trench. Not the trench. Okay. This is the other side of the wall. The work on the, the repair and the, the, the vehicle storage side has gone quite well and it's done. Um, the, the crews do, uh, did a really nice job over there, actually. They did a great job of it. The problem on the garage side is that uh, we have some mold issues that um, make it difficult for us to have our workers go in there and do floor repairs where there's mold that needs to be mitigated. So the, the, uh, really the goal of this contract is to have Time Bond help us with design and bidding of um, demolition of the slab in the areas where mold exists. So the slab would be demoed, mold would be uh, remediated, there'd be um, removal of groundwater and cleaning out of this sort of void space. And once everything's kind of clean over there, We'll have uh, our staff go in and place uh, compacted backfill and um, con uh, control density fill and then do the concrete pour to fix the floor. So it's basically to help with the remediation of the mold um, through the design and contracting, the remediation contractor for that. And will we get a, a biddable document out of this? Or we will. Simply we will. We will. They'll, they'll give us uh, bid documents suitable for bidding, and they will provide some um, bidding phase services and um, some time for inspection during the remediation of the mold. So I think it's everything we need out of time bond in order to get that side of the of the building kind of cleaned up to the point to the point where we can go and fix it. Who's going to do the mold remediation? We don't know. It'll have to be bid. I don't know when the contractors will pay. And is there any intention for our people to do the uh, to go back in and refill it? And yes, same as the trench. Okay. Yep. Gary. So, so the deal is that to do the remediation, somebody has to do some demolition. So there's got to be a design for controlled construction, right? right? To contain whatever the hazards are while it's being demolished. You can't remediate and then somebody else do the demolition is one and the same. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Because there's, there's sort of a negative air thing you need to yep. capture the spores and the whole thing. Yeah, no, it sounds like it's nice as removal. Almost, but yeah. you're talking about concrete removal. Yeah. Right, right with, with mold removal. Yeah. 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 Under a controlled environment. Anything else? All in favor of approving this contract? Aye. 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 Mm. Yeah. All right, Mike. Uh, next contract for purchase of land on Rocks Road and Chestnut Mountain Road to Matthew G. Martin in the amount of sixty-six thousand. Sixty-six thousand five hundred dollars. 
<laughs> so um, this agreement here, there's only two sets of it, but basically it sets up for the closing of the purchase of this land on or before June 30th, 2013. Uh, this is also the parcel that was discussed in executive session a number of times. Uh, immediately there's a $1,500 option check that's sent to them, and the $65,000 is for the purchase of the land itself. And this money is coming out of our timber account. Uh, the, it's not coming out of the timber revenue account because we have no revenues okay. at this point. There was actually a line item that was put in the FY13 budget of $200,000 for land acquisitions. And that's where this money is coming from. All right. Uh, so this is the land we've talked about several times. All in favor of making the purchase? Hi. Hi. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hi. Can someone refresh my memory on what the property owner requested and what we offered and what the appraisal numbers were? I believe the appraisal... I, I, I thought that we had two appraisals done. One How about this? What, what did we authorize? Did we authorize this amount previously? It did. Fine, but I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm all set. The question I have is, we still have money, the remainder of the 200000 Right, because there are other acquisitions that we're looking to... Come in. Yes. Okay, now call the question. All in favor of approving this purchase? Aye. Aye. Uh, emergency contract for repair of the sewer main on 177 to 179 Prospect Street. To AJ Virgilio Construction, a amount not to exceed twenty-five thousand dollars. Second. This was an emergency repair we did on a sewer service on Prospect Street. Um, we actually got an emergency waiver certification from the state to do this. We had to move quite quickly. Um, the service line to a tenant house was broken, and they had no sewer services, so we were able to get literally almost overnight AJ Vir Virgilio in here under a bid and start the work, and it took them about three days to complete the project. The sewer line was um, over 12 feet in depth, and our crews just can't go that deep. But the, was the problem in the private or the public side? Our side. It was in the, it was in the, the, the public layout of the, of the city. Just for um, the amusement of the board, uh, years ago, maybe 10 years ago or more, there was another a problem on Prospect, and again, it was really deep. Mm -hmm. And there's long discussions about the fact that uh, there are very few private contractors who could go that deep. We had that kind of stuff. And we kind of modified. We used to be very strict about, like, hey, it's your line, you know. Uh, but that was the, be the beginning of the crack where we started to think of the sewer, cust as sewer, uh, what would you call them? The, 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 Users, we began to think of them as customers, and maybe we could be a little more flexible about the way we handle this stuff. <coughs> what, what did we vote on in the, the committee meeting? This is it. You say identical? Okay, I don't know. We don't remember the figures. This is, this is what you signed? Okay. Yeah, a few get, of you had signed it. But we didn't get all the signatures we needed, which is why it probably exactly. was not We only got three signatures. That's why it's here tonight. You mean nobody showed up? No one. Not one. Not one. Not even, <laughs> Not even <laughs> with a second email. Thank you, though. Ouch. I was way far away. You guys are on my list. I just was so sure. I wouldn't do any of that. All right, so I think yes, we are, we need a vote on this, baby. Um, so this is a vote to approve this emergency contract. We can say no, right? Well, we're we're just can't. All in favor of approving the contract? Aye, aye, aye. aye, aye. <laughs> Okay, contract for pavement management software to BHP in the amount of nine thousand one hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. Move approval. Second. This is our annual contract with BHP, who does our pavement inventory for us that we 
utilize to come up with our paving list and crack sealing list and maintenance repair list for our streets. It's the same price as last year's. Uh, this is our 13th year doing it with VHB. What they do is they, they do a survey of 25% of the roads each year. So basically every four years we have a, a, a second look at the street again. So we're always continuing to update the database. And like I said, this is used for uh, the proprietary software for developing uh, what streets we're going to pay and how we're going to repair them based on different scenarios. All in favor of approving this contract? Aye. 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 Uh, contract for timber harvest. Timber harvest, oh, it's not really meant to be capitalized, I don't think. Contract for a timber harvest of the Ryan and West Wayland Reservoir water supply property to the Allard Brothers in the amount of 28400 We opened up bids um, for timber management uh, activity um, recently. Um, for work that was being uh, work that was designed by Mike Mari on our license forestry. So we have a contract with Mike uh, to develop these bid documents and we advertised the bid. We received one bid from Allard Brothers um, in the amount that, that we discussed for twenty eight thousand dollars four hundred. Um, Mike's estimate of the value of the, the timber that's being uh, harvested there was between twenty five and thirty five thousand dollars. So it's within the range that we expect it to, to receive based on the, um, the estimated amount of work that's going to be done. Um, there, are, there are five stands uh, where this work is going to be done, which I can point out on the map if people are so inclined. Um, there's a variety of land management um, techniques that are being done, but the sum, the sum of the work that's being done is uh, 320000 uh, board feet of timber, including white pine, red pine, hemlock, red oak, red maple, blake, black birch, and mixed hardwood. Approximately 1,113 cords of firewood and uh, pulp wood from about 12,400 trees, including mixed hardwood, white pine, red pine, and hemlock. Um, that's kind of the overview of, of where we're at. Um, we, bid the, we bid this uh, just recently. Most loggers have their work lined up for the winter already. We're anticipating that this work probably won't start until October of, of this fall, and then um, proceed through the winter. Um, so I think that's probably about it. Most folks have questions about it. Is this up along the Hanhock Trail? Is it on the west side? That is. Well, I just want to come out since you're asking. Um, we've got one one lot here in Williamsburg. This is. This is Ten Hawk Trail here. <coughs> so there's one one lot on the west side, um, and then the other lots are these ones, which are in the watershed for the Ryan Reservoir. So this won't have any impact on access issues. It, it won't. And it won't at this point. Did, did we have multiple bidders? Uh, we had one bid. It's within the range bid. On the lower part of the range. It was in the range, right. We did send them out to four or five different people, though, the yeah. bids. And are there but only one bid. time constraints that prohibit them from doing the work during certain periods of the year that push this all the way to next October? Ideally, in the fall and winter time when the ground freezes, um, that's when we like to have them kind of crawling around up there with heavy equipment. So all in favor of accepting this contract for $28,000? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Seven, we've done eight. Uh, change order number one to contract 239-12 for the industrial park interceptor replacement design to Kleinfelder in the amount of zero. Uh, it's an extension. Of, this is an extension of the contract. This is a time extension for the contract. Um, that the city's procurement officer said we needed to get the board to approve. We had a, a contract schedule with Kleinfelder for the design of this industrial park interceptor sewer. Um, they're doing quite well on the project. Um, they've provided everything that we asked. There were some delays on our side where they were waiting for input from us that caused an overall project delay, which is why they've fallen behind. Um, so we're looking at extending 
the completion date to the end of uh, 2013. Um, just as a refresher, we have the, the industrial park interceptor is pretty much at capacity as it comes from the, uh, the Coca-Cola plant into the pump station. So we're looking at increasing the diameter of that pipe. Kleinfelder has come up with um, sort of an innovative solution in terms of the, a route to run the new, the new line that should save us, should be easy to build and save us some money. So we're happy with where we are, but um, we're behind on the date. Would we end up with two lines then? We would abandon one line. The old line. The old one out. It's a good question, though. It's something to thought about. Well, is there any potential use of the old line? There's one section of it I think that it might make sense, but we're there's a things we're considering. And this goes through the pump station by the bike path? It goes through the pump station by the bike path, yeah. <coughs> Other questions? All in favor of approving the extension of this contract? Aye. Aye. Uh, number nine is a clarification. I think call it a reconsideration of the tourism sign and maintenance fees. And that is... Part of the uh, tourism sign policy under uh, page two or four item D that there's an annual fee of maintaining a tourist sign for fifty dollars. Um, this annual fee is coming around for the first time. We have two individuals that have tourism signs. One is the Mineral Hills Winery. They have four signs uh, in two locations, and uh, Hickory Dell Farm has one sign in one location. So. What we'd be asking for is a total of $200 each year from the Goddards to maintain their particular signs, which now I'm thinking more, it's come up. I think it's somewhat excessive, considering these signs are in the 150 to $200 each. For the sign itself, yeah. Right. And if they were destroyed by you know, a vehicle, we would actually go after the people's insurance company to pay for it also, rather than us. So... What I was proposing to do is that we have it per street. That way the two signs that are on Route 66 will be one fee of $50. The two signs on Chesterfield Road will be one fee of $50. So it will be a total of $100 to the Goddards. And the uh, Omasta family with the Hickory Dell Farm will be one $50 fee since they have one street where they have the sign on. But wouldn't that be unfair if you only have one sign to have Two That's why I said per street. The masses know. had the choice to put two, they didn't want to pay for two signs. I understand. But we would have included it in their application to have it in both directions if they'd asked for it. Right. But why would we not do it per sign, is what I'm saying? We can do it per sign. What's the lifespan of a sign? It, let's say, a absent being run over by a car. Um... These are new signs that meet the new reflectivity standards. I would say offhand that a sign of this caliber are probably 15 to 20 year signs. So what do we do with the 50 dollars? It goes into the, the revolving account. The party fund? No. <laughs> it goes into the revolving fund, mm -hmm. which is set up by the city council to support this particular venture. Does maintenance mean if the sign disappears, we replace it? Yes. Okay. Or if it gets run over and we don't know who ran it over, That's we correct. replace it? That's correct. And the signs cost? Well, anywhere between, depends on the <coughs> number of letters, whether it's a double width sign or a single width or height, mm -hmm. um, 150 to $200 is the current price of the signs. I think we should make it per sign. I agree with your modification. I appreciate you bringing this to us to reduce the cost. <coughs> but I, the, the cost would relate to not the street but the sign. Mm -hmm. So I would, I okay. would, I would say it should depend on the number of signs. <coughs> so do we have? A, I don't know if we have an, uh, a motion to accept. No, we we don't have a motion yet. Well, I don't. Is this for a motion? Yes. Oh, okay. Because well, I, we're sending out letters to the two owners and. Uh, like I said, I thought that one for the Mineral Hills Winery was somewhat excessive at two hundred dollars yeah. each calendar year. Yeah. I move that we charge uh, tourism sign maintenance fees per sign in the amount of 
that would be $25. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll second. <clears throat> Any other thoughts or discussion? Do we really only have five? Or some signs in the whole yeah. North Carolina. Well, it's about a that. new, it's sort of a new thing. Okay. We're really not interested in more tourists. <laughs> <laughs> We're not really interested. Thank uh, you. All in favor of uh, modifying the maintenance fee for tourism fund signs. Aye. 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 <coughs> uh, discussion of Pulaski Park. There's a little CPA activity that I'm sure Jim would like to tell us about. Yes. Pretty exciting. It's been an exciting birthday. change in state law that allows CPA monies to be used for existing parks. Um, before the change in state law, you could only use CPA funds for development of new new parks. So the money previously wasn't available for use for renovating plastic Um I was having some discussions with Wayne Fleiden in his office recently about um, sort of the master planning of um, parks and recreation facilities within the city. Wayne does a very nice job at, at managing things in sort of an orderly sequence and coordinating activities within the city with state grant opportunities for construction dollars. So in, in a recent uh, meeting with him, he identified um, <coughs> time frame, which would be 2014 for next year, for possibly getting an application with the state for construction money, which means that if we apply for a CPA grant this year, which we can do, and get funds for design, um, if the design and bidding documents are ready, we can apply for a state grant for construction dollars next year, and maybe be underway with, with the improvements to the park. So it's very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's where we're at. I had sent a uh, around a schedule for the CPA committee to the board. Um, there is a, an eligibility form, one page form, and it's due this week. I, I sent that over to the planning office earlier this week. Um, and then the full grant applications are due on February 5th. And then there's sort of a whole sequence of events by early May. Um, it's anticipated the city council will vote on funding approval for things. So. This project design could be starting, um, you know, on May, May time frame, and maybe back with a contract. So, uh, I need to prepare the grant application for the uh, CPA committee. I've already talked with Stephen Stinson and Associates, who is the landscape architect that was selected by the board, I think, in 2008, based on design competition. They're very, very excited to hear from me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> As you can imagine. I mean, but there's uh, what they remember. Good. They remember David Simpson and yeah. successors. Yeah, right. they remember us, uh, which is good. But they're very excited about about the project. We'll be submitting a uh, a scope and fee proposal for me to include with the grant. I discussed with with uh, the staff person in the planning office for the CPA committee about uh, public support for the project is always is always an important component of. Uh, Approval of, approval of grant applications in front of that committee. So I've only, I've only, continue. Meetings doesn't be. <laughs> She's much more high tech than me. Everything over there. <laughs> uh, but when when they mentioned to me the public support was uh, was important. I've just started to think about how do we re-energize all the folks that were involved. I mean, we had so much enthusiasm for improvements to the park. We had a separate committee, the design competition, many, many passionate people about the park. And we need to kind of regain um, the momentum that we had a couple of years ago when we were going through this. And any insight from the board on sort of re-energizing people that are interested in this and, and getting it forward, I think would be, you know, would be helpful for me. I just, you know, I can do the grant application. I have so many things, you know, so many things that we do, as you know. Um, and I can try to energize the public, but, you know, help, help in that regard would, would be would be great. I was going to talk to Ned about getting something up on the, on our website about the fact that we're going to apply for a grant. And we'll be, obviously, there will be press once the grant application goes in, so it'll, it'll have some legs of its own once once it gets out that uh, the city is thinking about uh, renovating the park. 
I think people will start coming out. But anyway, um, that, that was why, that was really the main reason I had it on the agenda, just to let you know that the project's starting in terms of a grant application, and we may get funding, and then, you know, we'll be good. Right. When is the CPA, did you say it was in the fall? You're doing the grant application now? Grant application. And the hearing, or the public, or what's the public component? So, uh, well, the grant application is due the 5th, uh -huh. and then the public component would be during um, the CPA's uh, review of the projects that were submitted. So that would be in February, um, you know, February into March, mm. uh, through March 20th, and then they complete their recommendations on April 3rd. So I would say, you know, between now and March 30th, we need to, to find the people that are interested in supporting the project making them aware of meetings at the, the CPC committee, trying to coordinate folks to come out and, and speak in favor of the of uh, grant approval. But the grant is, you know, it's a project that's clearly eligible. I don't mm -hmm. think we have to worry about that. It's mm -hmm. just where does it stack up among other yeah. projects and what's the public support <clears throat> for it. So. so do we have those original lists of all the people that were involved? We do. I have a file. Of, there was an original committee that mm -hmm. was uh, many, many people on that committee. Mm -hmm. I forget. I don't actually recall. How the, how the committee was appointed originally, but it was, do you remember it was a board? Uh, Bob Reckman uh, really helped a lot on that, and yeah. the mayor, Claire, Claire, uh, Maybe Claire appointed he and him. the mayor put it together. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> as we kept going, remember the parent groups mm -hmm. were involved, and the bid has come to me, in the interim, the bid came to me. Joe Blumenthal was wondering whether the bid could get involved on the stage. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. They even paid Klondike to come down and analyze that spot, of which was a bad slap echo wow. back and forth between the two buildings. So wow. they're not loving putting the stage against the Academy of Music. But, but they're, they're somewhat interested in that whole process. Okay. So parents groups who are interested in the playground component, the bid. The I can take out the what? Occupy. The, the Occupy, right? I'm sure the, no, the tent area really over here high. and the showers <laughs> over there. I can go back to the to the, uh, to the to the original committee. I think I have everyone's email and, and just, you know, sort of do an email with the folks that I know that were originally involved, like you're saying, the bid and, you know, the people that were on that committee, Senate for the Arts, or for the Arts Council. Um, but there were a lot of people involved at that time. I, I, think can, I can see what I have. But and the website. This is a very short time period, but asking people, I mean, I don't know if we want to ask people for setting up a meeting or asking people just, here are the meetings in which you can go, go to to support this. <coughs> Excuse me. Website still up and running? I don't know. It was, it was like three years ago. Right. Okay. Oh, Mike? It seems to me that this is the kind of effort that might require some personal contact mm -hmm. because. It, it wouldn't surprise me if everyone thinks that someone else is going to do this. Yeah. Uh, was there a chairman that ran the committee? I think? don't. I don't remember. I was part of it. I don't remember. Bob, Bob Reckman was. Yeah, there. I think yeah. Bob. Yeah. But you know, I could. You could. One of us could call Bob Reckman, mm -hmm. and he has. I would. I'm presupposing that he might have more time on his hands right now. I, this is not a good time for me. The school starting back up, but. Um, but I would, you know, I'm happy to also have chatting with Bob as well. I can get in touch with him and, and <coughs> see what he can do. He, he's, he was a great resource during yeah. the original committee. And I'm happy to chat with him. So. Garrett? I would imagine we'd want to talk to our current mayor and whoever the ward councilor is. I don't know who our downtown. Sam Lawrence. Pam. 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 I was very excited to see this, so. All right. Okay. That's great. Thank Good you. catch. Yeah. Um, all right, next is private ways, and man, we've got some excitement this weekend. <laughs> we have, do we have supportive weather? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah beautiful weather on Saturday. Saturday. Sunday's bad, right? Sunday's mm -hmm. not so bad. Friday's not good. Okay. Well, luckily, we're going to do it on Saturday. Yeah. I know. Yes. That's why I was trying to do it. Because Saturday, that we were going to do it before Gary and I met in River Valley Market, and we were so glad we yeah. were out there and doing private ways. Yeah, it's kind of right. cold, as I recall. Can I move? We do it the same way as last time with the uh, meeting up here and then getting into the future. Sure. Yeah. 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 About quarter of nine. 
That's good. Yeah. And we're going to have a real coffee stop in the middle. Chocolate croissants, not mm -hmm. some vegan None of the vegan stuff. Yeah. Soy milk. It wasn't on the, I, I noticed it wasn't on the list. I know. Well, it's That's not right. on the private website. We, we, we would have to the, the December attempt to do this didn't take place. No, we, no, we moved it. We waited for you. We wanted you to be with us. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get a form. Yeah. We actually couldn't get a form. For third January. Yeah. Well, this weekend's not bad. Well, yes, we next time I have the agenda, do you want me to put a half hour in the middle? No. <laughs> no, no I, make them awesome. I think we have view, <laughs> view Avenue in the middle, which is a very, very short street with one resident on it, so we won't be able to move rather quickly. Yeah. So we'll plan our break room. <laughs> Um, Ned and Jim and I were talking before the meeting. So we're meeting here at what time? 845. So we were talking before the meeting, and the question, well, was it just a lame meeting? No, the excuse that you didn't have a quorum. You don't need a quorum for you. It's public hearing. Yeah, it's public hearing. Well, you might be right. I would say. It's, it sounded like a good excuse. I think it was an excellent one if I were you. So, uh, all right. So here's, here's the deal. Um, the, 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 the ones we did last time, we were looking uh, to see if they even belonged on the list of potential city streets. Um, and there are still a couple of iffy ones in this group we're going to look at mm -hmm. Saturday. But... If we continue down this path of looking at them in chunks, we're, we may get ahead of the city council, and we may get ahead of the process where people send in petitions asking the city to uh, consider accepting their streets. And so the question is, if we go look at a street that we think would be a good candidate to become a city street, and four months from now the residents get around to sending in their petition, do we have to go back no. Is the question? <coughs> yes. 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 Why? You have to hold a public hearing for right. street acceptance. All right. We're really just doing research and analysis right now. So the process could drag on ad infinitum. Well, so I'd like to, before we do another group, you know, past Saturday, I'd like to see if there's a way that we can um, do it just once, once per street. Yeah. One of the things we wanted to do was was go through the whole list to make sure that if we felt the street didn't qualify, was not a, an appropriate candidate, right. then we could advise them well in advance of next winter so that right. we could tell them we're going to stop plowing so that I, I kind of think we have to do go through the process. Cause well, it, well I'm, only, I'm only looking for... And, and we may wind up talking to Alan Seawald about this. I'm just looking for a, a mechanism by, we, by which we could just do it one time. I, I got that, and, and I'd love that. Yeah. I think that would be great, but somehow we have to we have to notify everyone on the street that we don't think is, in the, is a candidate to be accepted as a public mm -hmm. way. I think we need to notify them this spring or something, yeah. because they need to form associations and make contract arrangements and find plowers and 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 if we wait for these folks to do something, it, we'll, we'll find ourselves, I'm afraid, next fall, we're in the same situation. We're with 30 streets fall. left, and who yeah. wants to do it? Yeah. We have 60 total? Well, we're working, anyway, so we're working yeah. on, the, we're yeah. just, we've just started talking about is, is there a way that we can do this so it's just one visit? Sure. For, for nice. example, the planning uh, department will sometimes, um, Wayne will sign, Carolyn Mish will sign, you know, the, the woman in the next office signs. It could be any six people who sign the petition. So what you could do is you could sign, you could, you could have, we have plenty of uh, employees here that live in the city. You could have petitions prepared and signed by residents that work here for all these different streets that you want to review, and then it sort of forces the paperwork ahead because there's a petition that exists, you go up to the site once and take a look at it and let your, let your public hearing and then you make a decision on it. So it's sort of, in a, in a way, it kind of explains it because the concern right now is you're going to go out to a, you're, you'll go out to a street Saturday 
and then you're going to get a petition, and then a month from now or two months from now, you're going to be back out there looking at right. the same thing. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of streets, and you're going to, you know, it's a lot of your time. So the petition, the, 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 the official public hearing has to occur after the petition's been filed? That's mm -hmm. correct. Couldn't occur simultaneously? Well, I'm not sure how you do it simultaneously. Bring the because petition the city, with you. Well, the city council has to... Uh, <coughs> have the petition recommended to uh, the board gotcha, 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 and gotcha, the planning gotcha. board for their recommendation. So okay. it flows down from city council and from here it flows back up. Okay. So this is where all of the subcommittee work comes in. We have a sense of what we think is yeah. acceptable or not already. I think you guys have a very good sense of that. So before we schedule the next mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. um, we'd like to see if we can streamline the process. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing that staff can do in advance also is that you have your criteria that you are looking at also. And the staff go through that criteria to see which ones make it and actually do the petitions, get the petition signed and sent to city councils for those streets that would meet your minimum criteria. And, go, and do those first. I mean, well, do, 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 do our own petition, right? Well, it has to go to city council. Right. City council has to go to city council meeting. They have to the thing send is it down. We, we initiate the petition so that we get that in right. the work. So that when we do go look at it, it we already have the right paperwork. Right. It would expedite things a lot. Yes. Yeah. But hypothetically, folks. Hypothetically is where I was going. Wonder if people, for some reason, in that area, did not want to have. Well, that's when you have your public hearing. They come out and say no. Oh, good. Okay, so that works. Yeah. That works. Yeah. That, was, that was my same question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So this uh, number of issues, uh, my understanding is, for example, once it's gone to the city council and then we sent down to us, we have some obligation to get to it in a timely manner. So, as an example, we could send all of the streets to the city council, have them all come to us. But I don't know if we could then chew away at them over the course of five or six months. Well, that's why we we'll use your constructive criteria that you had or your criteria that you had <coughs> and do a pre-evaluation that these ones meet the criteria that you set out that you would recommend to the city council. I mean, you can say no recommendation to the city council, and the city council still could accept it. That's their choice. It's going to cost the taxpayers money, though. <laughs> I mean, have we, we already taken away all the body beaters of all the ones that we know should remain no. private no. ways? No. So, a few, a few so those should be, if we have a next batch, maybe those are what should be in the next batch because there might not be any petition to the I mean, there th out of all those private ways, sir, I think there was 15 or 16 of those that we currently do nothing on anyways. Uh -huh. We We... Don't touch them. We don't maintain them. We don't snowplow them. We so they just remain private ways. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to go look at them. But but we do. But they're on the list. Oh no, we do have to have a public hearing. Why? Because we're not going to do anything. Mandel Road is a Smith College road that we don't do anything on. Correct. Correct. Uh, I know exactly what it looks like. I don't know why we'd ever want it to be a city street. We don't the have college. We ever want it to be a city street. So we don't have to no, do it's cut through in a parking lot. It's, it's not. It's, yeah. it's a private way. It's private property. It's we don't, but we don't have to have any public hearings on places that we're not going to continue as. We don't plow it now. Yeah, the we issue is if we were already it's plowing, it's yeah. a little bit of a process. Oh, so anyway, so we'll we'll okay. get we'll get back to you on this. Okay. That is the the hope, though, is to think to see if there's a way that can streamline fits process. all of yeah. the criteria. Yeah. Thank you for thinking. So we can just go out one time. <coughs> Saturday, I need to skip out of all the early so carpooling arrangements. People have fancy vans that will take multiple board members. It seems like a little party. I appreciate it because I need to leave early. Okay. And so we're going to meet here at 845? That's correct. Okay. I can fit four in my city, but three others besides myself in my city vehicle. I can fit Big three. Big truck. No, with the truck, yeah, you can all stand back uh, yeah. in the back, but, oh, but there are no windows. It's kind of a... <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> well, what'd you think? <laughs> uh, I can, I, I, that little red car is 
pretty roomy. Nothing. I sure. think we had. I thought we had three in the back seat in that one. We did. It worked out well actually. Yeah. That day we took that trip. They were singing after a while. They were. I think it was the Stones. Ninety-nine bottles of beer on the wall. I'll tell you. All right. So uh, I think that's. Oh, uh, no, hold on. Hold on. Um, we have one more. Stormwater, Stormwater and flood control. Um, I spoke with Paul Spector. Um, yeah, I understand from Mike and from Ned that um, there's a lot of excitement about getting a committee together to look at this issue. The concept is, broadly speaking, of someone from each ward of the city on the committee and a couple of other people. Uh, and the city councilors and the mayor are all working on appointing people right now. Um, and something may happen as soon as late this month, early February. Great, that's cool. Anything else, Jim? Yeah. I'm just waiting for the task force. Um, Gary, is there anything else that you would hope we would talk about tonight? Um, I just had a question, which was, how, how, how would one get information, and maybe you can't, um, about, a, a, you see a city truck doing something, mm -hmm. like the Pleasant Street thing, which I had to check my email, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but you see a city truck doing an emergency repair, where would, where would a citizen go to get information about what the problem was, and um, uh, what the time frame was, or any of that kind of thing, without having to necessarily pick up the phone and bother you guys. Do we, you guys have a mechanism for posting information of that type? No. I'm wondering if this is something, have you guys been following the, the mayor's yeah. app? Yes. Yeah, I'm wondering if this is something that we might want to think about. The, the reverse. Yeah. That's the reverse of his app. Yeah. Well, the original intention with the blog was that that's what, that, that's what, that would, information would also be there. Yeah. I'm just wondering, do you guys have to enter that information in some form somewhere as like a work order or something like that? Depends on what it is. If it's yeah. a work order or service order request from a resident, it's put in our work order system. Yeah. If it's a daily work activity, it's on our daily sheets. Yeah. See, I'm trying not to create more work for you guys, but at Thank the you. same time, figure out a way that we can get public access to information that you guys already have to collect. Um, so it's just a thought. I, but as I was driving by this thing, I was like, <clears throat> you know, it'd be nice to know that I should avoid this street for the next four days because it's down to one lane because of the snow and stuff like that, and I'll, I'll, I'll drive around it. So, How about a sometime. DPW Twitter account? Again, I'm trying not to create more work for these. It's only 185 characters, right? <laughs> but it's the snapping thereof that is the, that is the problem. So we are involved with Click Fix Connect. Or click, see, click, fix, rather, excuse me, it's Commonwealth Connect. Uh, we have two categories on it, one called potholes, the other one called other, which uh, we'll see how what happens with it. We're, we have Anne Marie and I are actually working on dividing that other in some. Some categories? Yes. Yeah, cause that, because we don't want them There is all other. very few others, it's just potholes. Potholes is much. probably our biggest work, that and trees are our two biggest requests. Tree inspections, tree trimmings. That's it then. Potholes and trees. Yeah, we got it. Well, it's there's just so lawn easy damage to use to get reports. You just click on it and you can get reports like very easily. And what's this again? On click fix. See click fix. See click fix. It's the new app. We went into Boston's and they have about 200 categories. Amazing. You can see everything. Parking so this tickets. would this would work the way Chris is talking. We could find information mm -hmm. about what's no. going on. So this is a way for you to enter a work order. Right. right. Yeah. It's a way for the public to enter a work order. Okay. Right. And take a picture of it and send it. You could also do uh, sidewalks that haven't been plowed. There's yeah. a category. Send that to the police department, please. Yeah. So maybe what but, I could, but we could do it from the app, right? If it was a feature of the app, sure. We don't so, enforce that. Though. But we, no, we don't. it's police that enforce right. that. Right, that's right. why I said that. So you can't make a category for that? No. Oh, you guys kind of like this? <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you have a system where you could send in a work order with a photograph, why couldn't you send in a, 
an inquiry with a photograph. What's going on here, Jackson Street, something, I don't know. Well, but that gets to the point of creating work for the yeah, department. Every one of these needs a response. Yeah. 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 So, anyhow. <laughs> 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 yeah. Nothing? 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 And the pond looks very nice. <laughs> yeah. Three you like it? Still the water? Yeah. yeah. Nothing. Mike, nothing? I'm all set, thank you. I have the Upper Roberts Meadow Dam. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, we do. We have just completed a large document for permitting that will be submitted on the 15th, by the 15th of January um, to the Massachusetts Environmental, Environmental Policy Act unit, um, which is really the first step in permitting. So, it's a document that will be going in. There's a public process associated with that, a comment period. We're sending copies to the friends and to the libraries, and we'll get a little bit of information out there about it. Um, but we're, uh, we're trying to get that uh, permit uh, situation rolling on the dam for this year and get final design and everything done. And it might be next year, maybe 2014 for that okay. construction. So this is for the removal. BJ, are you going to ask about one of those fancy new digital recorders? <laughs> no, I'm old school. I'm good. Okay. MJ? I'm good. How's your new job? Uh, good. Yeah. Get to talk about sewer pumps next. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Dave, is there anything? Uh, any, anything happening on the new building? I assume the answer is no, but what about the five year capital plan for the city? The building committee's meeting on Friday, yeah. the reconstituted building committee. <coughs> uh, remixed and reconstituted. Remixed and reconstituted. <laughs> Much more powerful. <laughs> Much more powerful. Uh, so the mayor is asking this newly constituted committee to revisit the whole thing and make a fresh recommendation. And I think it would be not talking out of school to say that he's hoping that this new committee will come back with a, a less expensive option. Um, That's where we were before. Mm. <laughs> a million dollars before. Well, so that's 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 what's happening. Well, well just a couple of quick comments. Um, I went to the police station opening and saw MJ there. MJ thinks we should have our meetings there because the rooms are so much nicer, but I don't want to speak for you. But I... Uh, security fair, too. Yeah, right, right. I, I... It was just one of those things that started happening where I started lobbying everybody I saw about... And the BPW... I mean, the DPW's next, right? And so I just want to throw that out. It's sort of a funny, funny circumstance, but it just came naturally, so... And then I want to make a comment about... I know that this is a complex issue, but I've been doing a lot of thinking because every day, twice a day, I, I'm part of the South Street pedestrian walkway, I go past it. And I, I'm sort of coming down on the side of the fact that it happened, that there were accidents and that people died, which is just horrible and sad, um, is because it just was not used enough. And so depending on what BPW I mean, DPW does, or the city transportation, or people with involvement, or the city. I think we should think seriously about doing away with that pedestrian walkway. So I'm, that's my personal opinion, but I'm just sharing it with the board. I drive past it two or three times a day. I think exactly the same thing. We have it's it's an odd crossing. There's a natural one up at the light. There's another one down by the the intersection with Old South Street. And and there's a traffic issue. I mean, we've lost the stacking oh, of both lanes. It, yeah. So now it backs up into the intersection yeah. uh, every time during rush hour. Yeah. It's, it's a problem. Well, it's not really our traffic. decision, though. These I days. know it's not. But <laughs> we made to recommendations to the mayor, and the mayor wanted the side of the crosswalk to stay at this point. Okay. Uh, we're having Nelson Nygaard look at it as part of the Main Street study and the intersection study as to what could be done there to improve that and keep it. Or maybe their recommendation will say to take it away. It's a historic crossing. It's been there forever. People use it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. It's sad what happened. Um, you know, 
know, this is one of the reasons we brought the bike lanes all the way to the crosswalk to show that it wasn't another lane to travel on. Mm -hmm. And this individual apparently yeah. drove down in there and the accident happened. But I think, but my, my point is that everybody had the empirical information for this. I don't, I think the reason that it, people, that drivers are not as um, aware is because it's not, not used enough. And and the fact that, that there are now traffic um, out uh, impacts because of, 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 you know, taking that, that space away. Well, I think so, there's probably something to that because, I mean, that was a school crossing at one point. Yeah. I know, I know, but I'm just yeah. saying that. So I think that people were, over, like, uber conscious of the fact that there was there was a traffic pattern there. Yeah, yeah. And, and pedestrian traffic. Pedestrian yeah. traffic. Yeah. 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 I, I keep thinking that uh, now that the design for Pulaski Park is sort of back on the table, that that will become part of that oh, piece. That cool there you go. Yeah. Oh. I was thinking Nelson Nygaard already looked at the intersection and getting the crosswalks designed right at the intersection may change all kinds of things, including um, queue times. I think the, the amount of time you actually sit and wait for all the different light sequences mm -hmm. may change dramatically in favor of reducing some of those mm -hmm. sequences, which would mean the traffic wouldn't back up. Because mm -hmm. they've already looked at that mm -hmm. conceptually once before, at least once before. Yeah. I can also say one more thing. I, I, I sort of felt the same way. It just didn't seem appropriate. But um, uh, one person, uh, I thought, had a really good argument about just, you know, hey, it's downtown. It's pedestrian. It's, it's, it's pedestrian. Mm -hmm. So why are we, why are we um, you know, handing over uh, access to the pavement to the motor vehicle when it's really mm -hmm. the pedestrian? If we really want to have a pedestrian-friendly downtown, we really need to think about that. Yeah. Crosswalk in particular. And it's, I think it's tied to the intersection. It's, it's tied to volume, but how much time you, how much time the cars have to wait. And it's possible you can actually improve flow, improve pedestrian safety by changing the crosswalks at the inter, outer intersection. I think Nelson Mega is the best consultant in that. Mm -hmm. So we're lucky that we have yeah. that. Yeah. Let's figure it out. I have a snow plowing question. I'm not going to hassle you about in front of the post office until spring paving season, but then I'll, then I'll be back on that. I've already had a conversation with Columbia Gas about that. Good. Oh. Have you we're driven over yet? I have. The, 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 the. We have got a program in the works now. I'm working with one of the engineers. And okay. My understanding of not hassle is different than his. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I lost my head. Um, now, in, I, live, I live back in one of the neighborhoods on South Street. Bit. And the, uh, there's quite a bit of ice buildup. Mm -hmm. And I've been telling people, talking through my head, I know, but I've been telling people that we've made a decision no. to cut back a little bit on the plowing in the neighborhoods. And that each pass, and I'm making up a number here, saves, say, $15,000 citywide. Totally made that up. But is there anything like to that? Number. No. No. <laughs> no. All right, so why did, why did we have such crummy uh, secondary roads in the last... Uh, More than likely what happened is that we have four, excuse me, currently, I believe, five vehicles that can deliver salt. And that's what we're doing this year is salt. So we do the main spurs, and then we do the side streets as we can, because we're limited to the amount of vehicles that we have. So if the pavement bonded with the snow prior to the application, it stays there for a while. So that's the whole point of salt, is to prevent the right. snow from bonding to the pavement. Yeah, but then you have to send out the plows for uh, a second or third third run over those streets. Well, once it bonds, I don't think the plows are going to take no. it the greater wood. <coughs> the greater wood, you'd have to scrape it down. But you, you or said natural it, melting. Yeah. But no, with, you, this is all over the city, though, I think? Mm -hmm. Or is it just my neighborhood? No, it's in a lot of places. <laughs> I was yeah. just driving down in a car just today, uh, <laughs> Green Street, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's pretty lumpy. So yeah. you could have signed the contract. I could have. <laughs> well, that was today. 
But you you were you you were trying that experimental what I call soy sauce type stuff, but but you decided not to. No, we we still use that. Oh, okay. Organic based de icer is what it is. It's yeah. a coating on the rock salt yeah. that makes it work at lower temperatures yeah. than straight salt would. Yeah. We used to do liquid runs up in the Sylvester Kennedy Road neighborhood because of the drinking water supply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our equipment's not running for that, so we're doing salt application runs out there too. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is get away from using excessive amounts of sand because of the cleanup costs, the sweepers, the catch basin cleaning, so on. So it's something that we're trying this year is really to get away from sand as much as we can. So if you sent out, if you do a, a sweep of the city, a, a run of the plows, mm -hmm. what does that cost roughly? A decent snow event in excess of four to five inches, you're probably talking with cleanup afterwards, because we're cleaning downtown, um, you're probably talking the eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a storm. So we don't really think of it like, all right, we've been out twice, a third time maybe for cleanup. What's that third time? Yeah, I mean, we can't make some decisions like we're just going to not do the third run this winter and we'll save a total <clears throat> of 120000 over the course of the winter by skipping that third time around? Well, we have to keep the state streets safe and clear to some right. degree for ambulance services, fire services, police, residents, and so on. So we treat all the streets the same. Uh, like I said, the mains get hit first as far as treatment, pre-treatment in advance. And then as we can, they go out to the rural arterials and collectors and so on. You know, they just move throughout the city, but the fact is that we do have limited sanders here, or sanding bodies that would distribute salt in the city. So none of it is a strategic attempt to save, to scale back our effort and maybe save a little money. We've already tried that. Well, like downtown, they we had we were picking downtown during the daytime. Right. It was an absolute nightmare. We thought we were going to chop people up into little pieces down there, because the drivers don't want to deal with us. Yet we're trying to do our work. So that went back to a nighttime operation, which is an overtime operation. And every night you go downtown to pick, it's about seven to $8,000 that we incur every time we have to go do snow removal downtown. We are picking the side streets of downtown during the day right now to open them up because they, they, the width has been compromised because of the snow banks. So we're down on the, the Holly and Market Street neighborhoods picking snow at this point during the daytime. The other problem that you have is that you have a parking ban that goes from midnight to 6, and that's it. So if you have an event that you're snow plowing during the daytime, and the residents are parked there, the only time you can go back there and clean the street is during the nighttime. So you have a second run going out there because we don't have a 24-hour day parking ban like other communities have. <coughs> and so would you say that the uh, I mean, historical background there was a big to-do back in the 90s about a, an event where the snow stuck to the street, and the mayor was livid about it. And and the DPW director was very defensive about it. Um, and I, th I think he, you know, I don't think it was his fault, but the two of them were having a hard time. They were in a bad spot, the two of them. And uh, basically the decision of the department at the time was, all right, God damn it, we're going for black pavement. You want black pavement? We'll give you black pavement. And see if you like the price. Well, I keep thinking of, you know, there must be a way to back up a little bit from that. If we could save the city $100,000 a year. Let the city tell me not to pave the roads or not to have black pavement. They haven't instructed us to do that. No. Okay. We've been, we're skimping where we can. We save where we can. But the fact is it costs money to remove snow and ice. The other thing, too, is that how do you cut back from a budget that's 50% under budgeted to start with? Mm. Mm. You, we have, have we spend seven to eight hundred thousand dollars a year, yeah. and this is the first year in six years that they've increased the budget from three twenty-five to uh, right, four twenty-five. We still don't have enough budget to do what we're supposed to do, and they expect us to cut a budget. It's impossible, mm. not with that dollar differential. If it was seven hundred thousand, they want you to cut to six fifty. You've got a little wiggle room, but to go from 700000 to 450000 Well, no, no one expects that. I mean, you know how this works. But 
I mean, we, we had talked about the citywide ban again. Get all the cars off the street during a snow event. Replow once. Period. City council wouldn't go for it? Uh, the mayor didn't want to go for it at that point. It wasn't uh, Mayor Narcos, it was Mayor Higgins. But mm -hmm. the fact that the residents are used to park, they don't have the drivers to park. Mm -hmm. They have to park in the streets downtown. They don't have the driveway capacity with the infill. I'm all for saving money, too, believe me. Well, I'll stop using that excuse. Like, oh, no, it's, it's the new, new, we're saving money. Okay. Make a motion, Major. Okay. Thank you, everyone.